This podcast is brought to you by Audible. Have you been wanting to read more, but don't seem to have the time? Well, with Audible, you can read your books without having to find the extra time in your busy schedule. Stuck in traffic on your way home from work? Why not marathon the Harry Potter books? In the gym and want to learn about the First Lady? Well, you can listen to Becoming Michelle Obama while doing Leg Day. And if you go to audibletrial.com slash cultivate, you get a month free of Audible. That includes one credit that you can trade in for any audiobook of your choice, access to thousands of audiobooks free to listen to with your account, and best of all, you have access to all of your favorite podcasts in the app as well. So be sure to go to my link, audibletrial.com slash cultivate, that's C-U-L-T-I-V, the number eight, to sign up for a free month of Audible and start reading today. Thank you, Audible, for supporting the show. We are. We are. We are Cultivate. 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 We are Cultivate. Hello and welcome to Yield Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. Hello. How's it going? It's going. I'm a little disappointed that the sun isn't shining as much today as it was yesterday, but the day is still early. It's supposed to be in the 60s today. Dang, swimsuit weather. I know. It's supposed to be in the 60s today and then snow on Thursday. It's like, yep, that's about right. Yep. Welcome to Minnesota. Remember last week when I said I was going to ease us into murder? Are you going to be like Minnesota? (laughs) And have it snow on Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I am just going to dump a shitload of murder on us right now. Oh, no. Oh, sorry no. about it. Okay. Not sorry about it. It's okay. I just ate. Can't wait for this. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's good. Just good start. What? <laughs> Today, we're going to be talking about the servant girl murders. Oh, no. Are you familiar with this at all? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure stuff like this has happened, but... You may recall it once we get into it. Okay. The cases themselves have also gone by the names of like the Servant Girl Annihilator, the Austin Axe Murderer, and the Midnight Assassin. Okay, let's get into it. This one's going to be a little bit of a long one. Because I fell down some rabbit holes. <laughs> For some reason, I, I immediately was like, it's like, I fell down some stairs. Here's some... <laughs> here's some- <laughs> Like that's when you're like, I feel that rabbit holes. I'm like, stairs. <laughs> stairs of truth. I'm just at the bottom of this. I'm just at the bottom of the stairs, like twitching. Like, oh my God, I felt so hard for this case. <laughs> There's so much murder. The stairs of truth. There's so much research. Okay. A 2017 mental floss article by Sonia Vyomsky in 1885. Austin American Statesman newspaper. I did seven different articles from that newspaper. Nice. Good journalism. The Servant Girl Murders website. So there's like three different sources for that website and Wikipedia. So it doesn't sound like I have a ton of sources this week, but I actually like really dived in on two of these sources. They were dense articles. They were dense. And links to all these articles will be included in the show notes. Back in the 1860s, Austin, Texas was little more than a Wild West cow town with a population of less than 5,000. By 1884, when our story starts, the city had grown to the point that it boasted a population of 14,500 residents. Dang, that's a big boom in what, less than 20 years? Yep. Wow. It, uh, at like the beginning of the 1880s, they had a huge construction boom. Yeah. Well, and w- wasn't the government, too, making a lot of incentives for people to move out west? Yeah, I think so. During that time. Mm-hmm. 
Unfortunately for the residents of Austin, their city would become the scene of unimaginable horror between late 1884 and Christmas of 1885. Christmas? Yeah. The first victim was a woman named Molly Smith, who was found in the snow by her employer's home on December 30th, 1884. Molly was a young African-American cook who had been working for the family of Mr. W.K. Hall, an insurance man who had moved to Austin from Galveston. She'd only been working for him for a month when she was found with a gaping axe wound on her head. Oh, no. Was it just the one wound? Mm-mm. Oh. Upon further inspection, it was found that she had also sustained stab wounds to her chest, abdomen, legs, and arms. In fact, there was such a large pool of blood beneath her in the snow that it was as if she was floating on top of it. Oh, that's awful. The gruesome attack was documented in the January 1st, 1885 edition of the Austin American Statesman. Here's an excerpt from that article. And you have to remember, this is a different time, so some of the language that is used is outdated and not okay. And in poor taste, yeah. This is a quote. Quote, a young colored fellow named Walter Spencer has been coming to see her for some months, and the couple, though not married, were lately living in the relation of man and wife. Between three and four o'clock Wednesday morning, Mr. Thomas Chalmers, a brother of Mrs. Hall, was aroused from sleep by the entrance of Spencer. He was bleeding freely from several wounds on the head and said, Mr. Tom, for God's sake, do something to help me. Somebody has nearly killed me. End quote. Thomas woke up at once and after lighting a candle, saw that Walter, age 30, was indeed badly injured. He couldn't tell exactly what had happened to him, but Thomas instructed Walter to head to the doctors and get his wounds tended to. Walter and Molly had been living in a small apartment in the rear of the house, just behind the kitchen. After Walter went to the doctor, no one knew exactly what had happened to Molly. In fact, her disappearance wasn't really noted until around 9 a.m. the morning after the attack, December 31st, when a servant who worked for the neighbor next door remarked that they had seen something peculiar in the hall's backyard. Oh, no. It was after this report that several people hurried into the yard where they found Molly dead. Another quote from the same article of the Austin American Statesman said as follows, quote, The reason she had not been discovered earlier was that she lay immediately behind a small outhouse, and no one thought of looking for her there. From the outhouse to the room where she slept was about 50 steps. So the unfortunate victim of the brutal attack had been dragged to the spot where her dead body was found. All the circumstances go to show that the murder was committed in the room where the two were sleeping, end quote. That would make sense why he wouldn't know what happened mm -hmm. if he had been sleeping. You'll notice that becomes a pattern. Uh... <laughs> no, it's <Murder. a> stress. <laughs> <laughs> Molly was described as, quote, a light-colored mulatto, apparently about 25 years of age, end quote. She had been born in Virginia in 1857 and moved to Texas in the 1870s to work for friend Ovid Rogers in Waco. She is listed in the Austin City Directory in the 1880s, where she had been working at the home of Frank Woodburn prior to working at the home of Walter Hall. She also had a 10-year-old son named George. Molly was listed as unmarried in the 1880s census and her son was not mentioned in the newspaper during the time of her murder. Some speculate, because he was not with her the night she was slain, that he was, in fact, the son of Robert Rogers, who was the son of her previous employer in Waco, and the same age as her. Oh. And I did read in one of my sources that the boy had been raised by his supposed or believed to be father. Mm -hmm. So... To my understanding, he didn't have any idea what had happened to his mother as far as, like, her being murdered and things like that. Oh, that's awful. But then again, if it's a small child. Yeah. 
And I believe the man that had fathered her child was also a lawyer. So he was able to like provide adequate care for their mm -hmm. son. So yeah. silver lining. Yeah. Upon looking at the scene, it was clear where her murderer had dragged her from the scene of the crime. Molly was barely clothed, and inside the room where she and Walter had been attacked, there was evidence of a struggle. Bloody finger marks on the door, broken glass, furniture in complete disarray. The bedding, including the pillows, was covered in blood. At the foot of the bed was an axe, what many believed to be the murder weapon, as it was too blood-stained for it to not be a coincidence. Yeah. And to just be sitting yeah. there. You don't just decorate it with blood before you leave a crime scene. Yeah. One theory as to who had killed Molly was that she had gotten into an altercation with Walter. It was quickly discounted, though, as just a theory, as the pair had previously been kind and loving to one another. And also, he was also injured. Why would he injure himself? Right. With an well, axe. It'd, it'd be really difficult. Didn't you say it was like the back of his head that was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it'd be it'd be really difficult for him to do that to himself. Yeah, and to not kill himself in the process. Right. A second theory came out following the arrest of a man named William Brooks, an African-American that was employed as a bartender at the Barrel House Saloon on East Pecan, not far from the residence of Mr. Hall. William was one of Molly's former lovers who had known her in Waco, where she had previously lived prior to moving to Austin. This theory focuses on William being jealous of her relationship with Walter. Mm. William was arrested and thrown in jail on the afternoon of December 31st, 1884, on suspicion of murder. He is quoted as saying to a local reporter, quote, I know both the woman Molly Smith and Walter Spencer. I like them both and never had any falling out with either. I knew her in Waco, and have had nothing to do with her here. I am innocent of the murder, and can prove by any number of witnesses that I was at a ball on Sand Hill, near the Tillotson Institute, till four o'clock in the morning, and was the prompter. They have got hold of the wrong man, sure. End quote. Hmm. So he'd pretty much been like the hype man for this event. Yeah. And he had to stay the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. So people would have been able to verify, yeah, he was there until four in the morning. But didn't this occur around four in the morning? Or did did Walter run out and alert him, his boss? Walter alerted him between three and four o'clock. Okay, so it happened before. Yeah. The police also spoke to Walter himself, although it was hard for him to do so. Walter had sustained several facial wounds, the most serious being a puncture under one of his eyes that fractured the orbital bone. Oh, ouch. Yeah, so I would imagine talking is something he would not have wanted to do a lot of. No. Walter stated the following, and this is a little bit of a longer quote, I apologize, but... It's important. For the quotes that I use from the newspapers... They're important and they paint a picture that I felt was worth including. Quote, it was sometime between nine and 10 o'clock Tuesday night that I went to Molly's room. She complained of being sick and asked me if I wasn't sorry for her. She also told me to wake her up early the next morning. I don't remember anything else that happened till I woke and found myself hurt. I don't know who did it, but it wasn't Molly. I thought somebody had killed me. Molly was not in the room, and I never saw her anymore. I went round in front of the house, woke Mr. Chalmers, and told him what had happened. He told me to go to the doctor. I went out the back way and noticed that the gate was wide open, though I recollected having fastened it. I first went to the house of a colored man living near, and he gave me a seat. Then I went to see Dr. Ralph Steiner, who washed and dressed my wound. I then went back to Mr. Hall's and found the front gate open. Then I started uptown, but was so weak that I fell down several times before getting to my brother's restaurant on Brazos Street near Newton's Saloon. It was about six o'clock in the morning when I got there, and he had me taken home in a hack. I have not quarreled with anybody but Brooks. Some three months ago, he wanted to fight me. 
he had stayed with Molly in Waco. But I don't say that he was the one. I don't know who did it, but anybody could have gotten to the room easily through the door connecting it with the kitchen, end quote. Mm. If you'll remember where she lived, it was on the very back of the house and it was yeah. connected to the house via the kitchen. So if someone had gone into the house, they could have easily just walked in. Mm -hmm. In the end, both William and Walter were let go and the real identity of the killer was never discovered. So that was December 30th. Okay. All was quiet after this seemingly random attack until May 7th, 1885. Eliza Shelley, age 30, another African-American cook, was found slain with her head nearly split in two with an axe. Jeez. According to the May 8th, 1885 edition of the Austin American Statesman, Eliza was discovered by Dr. L.B. Johnson around 6 a.m. Eliza, who was employed by Dr. Johnson as his cook, lived in a small one-room cabin on his property with her three children, her eldest, Georgia, and two boys. The cabin, which was about 40 to 50 steps away from the main house, faced the Johnson residence and had an alley behind it. Okay. Interestingly, the central railway track was in front of his house. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Although the cabin was on the property, the main house and the cabin were separated by a high fence with a gate that allowed Eliza to go from the main house to her home. Her cabin was still part of his property, yeah. But his property was divided by a fence, so she had like a little bit of privacy, which is right. kind of nice. She was a little a little more removed, but it was kind of the same distance. Yeah, so she still was extremely close to the main house, mm -hmm. but there was the illusion of, privacy. you know, this is my own space. Yeah. Dr. Johnson was told by his wife that she believed Eliza had been murdered after she had heard shrill screams coming from the cabin. She sent her little niece out to see what was the matter. Are you, what? Why? I do not know. What? Yeah. Okay, so this woman sucks immediately. Yeah. Who was the youngest person that I can scar and send out to go see what's happening? Oh my gosh. Awful. God. And the girl returned very pale, saying that she'd just taken a peek in the room and what was inside was so awful she couldn't even say. Ant of the year. Seriously. Dr. Johnson's wife went out as well and experienced the same thing, quickly returning to her home as she waited for her husband to return. Dr. Johnson, quote, pushed open the door to view a most ghastly sight. Stretched on the floor lay the poor woman, quite dead, with a gaping wound over her right eye, fully two inches long and nearly that wide. Dang. It was done with some sharp instrument, probably a hatchet, which cleft through the skull to the brain. It was necessarily fatal and must have produced almost instant death. There were several minor wounds that must have been done with some other weapon. There was a deep round hole just over the ear and another between the eyes, also Ew. produced with some sharp instrument, end quote. That's disconcerting so that that to me makes me think of like a poker like for a fire mm -hmm. maybe oh god between the eyes Ugh. yeah i'm kind of hoping the axe thing killed her right away and she didn't have to deal with the other stuff first yeah yeah me too same with molly yeah like all the stabbings happened after Further examination of the room told the same story as that of Molly. The pillows and bedding were saturated with blood, and the room had been ransacked. Two trunks had been broken open and their contents thrown about the room. It was evident that Eliza had been dragged from the bed where she had been murdered and placed on a pile of patchwork that had been emptied onto the floor from one of the trunks. The culprit had also wrapped her body in a white counterpane that had been pulled off the bed. No weapons or other clues were left behind. What's a counterpane? I think it's one of those like curtain things that hang on the bed sometimes in that time. Okay, so it would have been like a four poster bed, like a canopy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
I think that's what a counterpane is. Dr. Johnson did discover the tracks of a barefoot man that led from the alley behind her cabin to her room and also back the way they came. Based on the impressions in the sandy soil, it was clear that the killer had short and wide feet. It's a leprechaun. It's a, it's a really angry leprechaun. <laughs> As I mentioned, she had three children, all who shared the bed with her, the oldest being eight years old. Her eldest, Georgia, was interviewed by a reporter for the Statesman and stated the following, quote, A man came in the room and asked me where my mother kept her money. I told him I didn't know. He told me to cover up my head. If I didn't, he would kill me. The man said he was going to St. Louis the next morning. End quote. Ew. Okay. She's eight. Yeah. When asked, she couldn't recall if the man was white or African American, but she told Mrs. Johnson that the man had told him had told her he was white. Why would you just say that? I don't know. Just so you know I'm white. I'm gonna murder your mom. I'm also five foot six, thirty pounds. Blonde hair, blue eyes. Yeah. I live down the street. Right. My name's George. <laughs> Here's my mailing address. The man had a white rag over his face, and she said that she had no idea anything had happened to her mother that night, having gone back to sleep until she woke up in the morning. Her two brothers were too small to be able to recall anything about what had happened the night before. So, wait, she was potentially in the same bed that her mom was getting murdered in. Sleeping next to yeah. mom. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm kind of hoping that the first and most severe blow killed her. And yeah. then he pulled her off the bed. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, just the idea that there were three children in there with her while she was being murdered is horrifying. Yep. Yep. Dr. Johnson swore he would do everything in his power to find out who had murdered Eliza, and the only motive he could conceive of was robbery, although she had no real savings outside of her standard salary that would have been worth stealing. Of course. I mean, she's got three kids. Well, and she's a servant. Yeah. <laughs> Eliza had previously lived in the country, where she had also worked for the doctor prior to them moving to the city. She was a good woman whose husband, Ike Shelley, was in the penitentiary in Huntsville. He was released in November of 1885, so at the end of that year. Hmm. Dr. Johnson had never seen anyone other than her children enter her cabin, and she had no other family that he was aware of. Eliza was about 30 years old at the time of her death, medium size, and, quote, of unmixed African blood, end quote. Okay. Justice Purnell summoned a jury of inquest early the same day, and it was concluded that Eliza Shelley had died from her wounds caused by a sharp instrument, and there were no clues as to who could have committed the crime. Some of those assembled believed the murder weapon was a sharp-edged tool, such as a, ha a hatchet or an axe, while others thought it was a blunter weapon. If it, like, made a deep cut in her head, wouldn't you assume it was a sharp object? You would Blunt think. objects aren't always as precise. You would think so. Later that afternoon, Deputy Sheriff John Holmes addressed a 19-year-old African-American boy named Andrew Williams, who lived in the home of an African-American woman nearby. Andrew was described in the paper as a quote-unquote half-wit, and at the time of his arrest, he was barefoot. Investigators planned to measure the tracks and do a comparison with his feet. Okay. At this time, even though Eliza was the second fatal attack on servant girls, several other attempts had also been made over the course of the last three months. Ew. Several had been assaulted, a couple badly beaten, and a girl of Swedish descent had even been shot in the back. Oh, so he had a gun at one point. Or they. It's like a gang of them. They were kind of trying to narrow down their, their M.O. at that point, I guess. Because there really wasn't one. Yeah, they were still trying to figure out how they wanted to go about doing it. 
An interesting thing of note in the article covering the case of Eliza is the following. Quote, a prominent gentleman remarked that it must be the work of a maniac. Another thought that the citizens should immediately organize a, vigilant, a vigilance committee. The colored people seemed ser seriously alarmed. I wonder why. Seriously. One was heard to say that he never expected to leave his house any more at night for fear his wife would be killed. It might not be amiss for the governor to offer a reward in this case. It does not matter that the victim is an obscure colored woman. Her life was as dear to her and should have been held as sacred as that of the proudest lady in the land. End quote. Nice. That's surprising to hear at that time. I know that's, that's a why surprising I to sentiment it. during that time and in that area. Where like, you know, kind of the Wild West as well. Like people got murdered all the time. That's why I wanted to include it because that was striking. Surprising. Mm -hmm. Unlike before, the third victim would be attacked much sooner. So the first murder or the last murder was May 7th. Mm-hmm. Irene Cross, age 33, an African-American servant, was attacked on May 23rd, 1885. So, like, a couple weeks later. So they're escalating. Mm -hmm. The following is an excerpt from an article about the attack. Quote, She was sleeping quietly in her own room, but had left the door unlocked for her son, but had left the door unlocked for her son, who kept late hours. The fiend came in. The startled woman cried out. He assaulted her with a long, sharp knife, perhaps a razor, and cut a horrible gash in her arm, severing the brachial artery. Another frightful wound was inflicted on her head. She died yesterday morning between 5 and 6 o'clock. End quote. Irene had been stabbed multiple times with a knife and practically scalped, but managed to live for two days after sustaining her injuries before ultimately passing away, making her the third official victim of the unknown murderer. That's awful. That is by far the worst death. Yeah. Having to survive two days after being essentially scalped. Yeah. Oh my god. It's awful. Irene was born in Mississippi around 1847, and in 1870, she and her husband, Haywood Cross, were living in Austin with their nine-year-old son, Washington. Irene was listed as widowed in 1880, and at the time she was murdered, she lived with her son Washington and her nephew Douglas Brown. The night she was murdered, her son had not been present, but her nephew Douglas was. He had seen the killer and described him as, quote, a big, chunky Negro man, barefooted and with his pants rolled up, end quote. Yeah, okay. Rolled up so he could run? Probably. Probably. It may surprise you to know that a short story author named O. Henry has been attributed as giving the killer their moniker. This guy's kind of an asshole. Uh, I was just going to say, O. Henry, O. Henry of the candy bar fame? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he was a short story author. Do they name a candy bar after him? I don't know. Maybe. Well, I don't know. In a letter Henry wrote to his friend Dave Hall in May 1885, so this probably would have been around the time of the murders, he stated, quote, town is fearfully dull, except for the frequent raids of the servant girl annihilators who make things lively during the dead hours of the night, end quote. Yeah, he's a dick. Fuck you, oh, Henry. Yeah. Fuck you and your candy bars. I haven't even had it, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, will I hope never. you choked on one of those candy bars, no, you asshole. No, never. Yeah, I think it has like a bunch of peanuts or something in it, so that makes sense. I hope you were allergic, you dick. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. Peanuts, <laughs> caramel, and fudge. I hope you choked on that. I hope you did too. <laughs> I realize they weren't around when you when this happened, but I It was invented in nineteen twenty, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say I hope you choked on it. <laughs> I hope in 50 years in the future, you choke on a candy bar. Because <laughs> <laughs> you deserve it. Okay, trigger warning for the next victim. No. This is going to involve the murder and sexual assault of a small child. Oh, God. If you need to skip ahead or stop listening, please do what you need to do. 
the nickname Servant Girl Annihilator wouldn't really work after the first three murders. Their next victim was 11-year-old Mary Ramey. On Sunday, August 30th, 1885, someone broke into the home of Mr. Valentine O. Weed between 4 or 5 a.m. via the kitchen before entering the bedroom. There they found Rebecca Ramey, age 50, and her daughter Mary, who were both sleeping. The assailant sandbagged Rebecca before dragging Mary into the adjoining washroom, or outhouse, Mm -hmm. where they sexually assaulted her before driving an iron pin into both of her ears to kill her. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah. Rebecca was in a lot of pain, the mother, Mm -hmm. and wounded by a sharp instrument in her left temple. Physicians stated that she had a fractured skull. Rebecca told reporters of the Statesman that she went to bed on Saturday around 9 p.m., heard the clock strike 10 and 11, and after that, she doesn't remember anything prior to being attacked. She didn't recognize their attacker. Hmm. Later that morning, Police Sergeant John Cheneville and Deputy Sheriff Harry White, accompanied by a man named Mr. Wilson, tracked down an African-American man named Tom Allen with tracking dogs. After measuring his feet and comparing those measurements to the barefoot tracks that were left at the scene of the crime, they arrested Tom when the footprints matched and he couldn't give an alibi regarding his whereabouts after 2 a.m. that day. Okay. Tom was examined by Dr. Burt about 16 hours after the assault and murder of Mary, and he concluded that Tom was not the man who had sexually assaulted her. Okay, so I I wonder then if he... If that was the first real instance that this could be more than one person. Possibly. Especially with all the different MOs, too. Mm -hmm. Well, in changing from both Rebecca and Mary were also African-American, but to go from 25, 30-year-old women to all of a sudden an 11-year-old girl. Yeah. that's, That's quite a jump. Right. And her death was a lot different. Yeah. Well, and... As far as I was able to determine, the first three were not sexually assaulted. Or at least if they were, it wasn't evident that they were sexually assaulted. Yeah. Or noted that they were. Justice Purnell once again assembled the jury, at which Mr. Weed gave the following testimony. And this is the man whose home Rebecca and Mary lived in and worked at. Quote, about five this Sunday a.m., I heard a noise out in the yard and asked my wife what was there and she said it was a dog howling. But I told her it was an unnatural sound, and I sprang up and went on the back gallery with a lamp in my hand. I then heard a noise in my kitchen. It was growing worse. I called my wife. There was something wrong, and I got my gun. She and I came together on the gallery and found the kitchen door locked. I called Becky repeatedly, but received no answer. I then went to the door of the kitchen and heard a noise in the cabin and told Lockbrush to hold the lamp And then I pushed the kitchen door open and asked the woman, Becky Ramey, what was the matter? She replied, I don't know. I'm sick. I then turned and hollered to William Jacqua and told him that I thought my two servants were murdered, that one was in the kitchen and the other was missing. I am satisfied that the noise I heard was from a person. As soon as Jacqua arrived, I got my jacket and took the lamp and then went into the cabin and found the girl dying. I then went for John Cheneville and his hounds, and then awoke Mr. Wilson and told him to bring his hounds, as Cheneville was waiting for them. When I came back, Dr. Swearingen had arrived. Dr. Swearingen, Mr. Jacqua, and myself went into the cabin and found the girl in a dying condition, with a small quantity of blood under her head. There was only a small quantity of blood on the floor near the girl when I first saw her, But when I returned, the quantity had increased to five or ten times more than there was at first. It is my opinion she had been injured not over half an hour when I first saw her. Rebecca Ramey had no men going to see her, and I think her a good and virtuous woman. The girl, Mary, was about 11 years of age, end quote. I'm really upset that she didn't die instantly from uh, pins in her ears. Yeah, it sounds like kind of based off what I'll be going into next, that she she suffered for a while, and that's really unfortunate. <sighs> Dr. Johnson verified that both women appeared to have been struck on the heads by sandbags, 
and Rebecca was pinned under one while her daughter was taken and assaulted. The doctor noted before the jury that a sharp instrument had been used on Mary in both ears, with the wounds being quite deep, even cutting a portion of her ears. Both physicians believe that Mary may have lay dying in the outhouse from her injuries for up to two hours before she ultimately passed an hour after she was discovered. That's so awful. Mm -hmm. Mary was born in Austin in 1875 and never knew her father, Jacob, who had passed away several months before she was born. Raised by her mother, Rebecca, she grew up with her older brother and sister, Edward and Minnie, her grandmother, Harriet Carrington, and uncle Edward H. Carrington, who opened Carrington Grocery in 1872, which was one of the first African-American-owned businesses in Austin, which is pretty cool. Nice. That's cool. Mary attended Central Grammar School, the same school that her siblings had attended. Following her death, her mother moved to East Austin and lived with her daughter Minnie and son-in-law Lee Green, where she lived until her death in February of 1909. Mary's brother Edward married a woman named Janet Lindsay in 1887, and passed away during an electrical accident at the saloon where he worked in 1888. Oof. Mary's sister, Minnie, passed away just three months after her mother in May of 1909. That's really young. Yeah. It's kind of unfortunate with her siblings, how they all kind of seem to pass. But I do recall reading that Rebecca, who I believe was 50 at the time of the mm -hmm. attack, so she lived... She lived a long life. She lived a long life for that time, late She's 50s, old. early 60s, when she eventually passed. But she just, she couldn't recover from it. Like she felt like it was, I don't know how you could. like she should have done something. She could have saved her. She had a lot of survivor's guilt. That's why she it, lived with her other daughter and just. Yeah. I think anybody would. Yeah. You know. I mean, that's a terrible loss. And it's your baby. It's your baby too. Like that was that was her youngest. Yeah, I don't fault her at all for for feeling that way and not being able to kind of move on. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't imagine. The next two victims weren't servants at all, but a couple of sweethearts: Gracie Vance, age twenty, and Orange Washington, age twenty-five. So that last murder was August thirtieth. Okay. On September twenty-eighth, eighteen eighty-five. The pair were discovered with their heads bludgeoned. The pair were discovered after William Dunham contacted his friend, Mr. Duff, at 1 a.m. regarding a noise he'd heard at the residence of the sweethearts in question. Gracie and Orange, both African-American, lived in a small wooden shanty as husband and wife on the rear section of William's property. Mm -hmm. According to an article published in The Statesman regarding the incident, quote, one of these, Orange Washington, was found lying across the bed, almost dead, with ghastly wounds in his head. Looking over the bloody and prostrate form of Washington, a woman was observed reclining upon her left elbow on a pallet on the floor, apparently badly wounded. Mr. Duff walked around to the door, discovered it was locked, and returning to the window, spoke to the woman and asked if she could unlock the door. She answered in the affirmative, opened the door, and Mr. Duff entered, followed by William Dunham. Upon questioning the woman as to what this all means, she at first replied, I don't know. Mm -hmm. The question was repeated when the woman felt her head and said, I don't know. I am burning up. Further than this, nothing was learned from her. Her name is Patsy Gibson. She has been employed as a cook at the residence of Dr. Graves and is said to have been spending the night at Gracie's as a visitor, end quote. So where was Gracie? Yeah. As the two men looked around, they noticed blood on the western window, as well as the fence outside. After following the trail of blood, about 75 yards from her home, Gracie's body was found. Her head, quote, almost beaten into jelly, end quote, by a rock that lay nearby. Oh my gosh. Patsy, the 17-year-old guest, wasn't the only guest in the shanty that night. A woman named Lucinda Body, also 17, had also been staying with the couple, and she was the one who roused the alarm after jumping through the window after she'd been hit by a sandbag. She even recognized the person assaulting her. Really? So this is the first time that that's happened? Mm -hmm. In her words, quote, He struck her, she got up, lit a lamp, and she spoke to him saying, 
oh, doc, don't do it. His reply was, God damn you, don't you look at me. Looking around the room, Lucinda saw what he had done, viewed the bloody scene, and again said, oh, doc, don't do it. His reply was, God damn you, don't look at me, blow out that light, end quote. After this, she had jumped out the window and ran towards William Dunham, who had left his house with his gun. She threw her arms around him and said, quote, we are all killed and Doc Woods did it, end quote. By this time, all of the neighbors had been roused by the screams and the noise, and a woman named Mrs. W.H. Hotchkiss yelled down from her second story window that someone was at the rear of her stable. The person started to run after several armed neighbors went to pursue them, and even though they fired on the man, he was able to escape, but this time they had a name, Doc Woods. Yeah. Once again, Justice Vaughn Rosenberg was given the details of what had happened. He assembled the jury and held an inquest. William Dunham was quoted as saying before the jury, quote, I have been to the county jail and identify the prisoner just brought in to be Doc Woods, who has been on my premises frequently and who was mentioned by Lucinda Body as the man who committed the outrages, end quote. A bloody shirt was also shown to the jury, which Doc Woods had been wearing upon his arrest. Okay. Dr. C. O. Weller, who was the first physician on the scene of the double murder, noted the following of the injuries that the couple sustained. This was really technical when I read it, so I tried to, like, de-technicalize it a little bit. Okay. So I did my best, because I am not a doctor. <laughs> Gracie had a deep cut in front of her right ear, a cut near the corner of her right eye, a deep cut above and in front of her right ear, about one and a half inches long, and a cut about an inch and a half long over the forehead, two or three inches above the right eye and a little outward and a cut about one and a half inches long to the left of the left eye, and one immediately above this an inch long, a cut about one and a half inches long in front of her left ear, a deep cut above the left ear, an inch in width and two inches long, one slight cut over the left ear, and two small deep cuts on the right cheek. No skull fractures. They were all superficial knife wounds. They were, yeah, they were just like slashing at her face. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until later that her head had been kind of smashed in with the rock which is horrifying patsy one of the guests had sustained a skull fracture as well as one wound about three to four inches long diagonally across the right side of her forehead that went down all the way to the bone so she'd been like hit by a sandbag and then struck in the head with a sharp instrument yeah lucinda the guest who had raised the alarm and recognized Doc Woods, sustained a deep cut on her scalp as well as a skull fracture. Orange Washington had a wound on the top of his head that divided his scalp all the way to the bone. Nope. Nope. This wound (laughs) extended along the back of his skull where it was fractured. He also had a cut on the middle finger of his right hand, but outside of that he had no other wounds. So I wonder if he had tried to like put his hand up. To, yeah. like, block whatever the attack was. And it got nicked during the attack. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. Several men were arrested prior to the inquest. This included an African-American man named Oliver Townsend, who was a well-known chicken thief. Doug Woods, another African-American man who was arrested at his home under suspicion of stealing a horse that was found near the scene of the murder. Okay. Doug was later released for lack of evidence. And another African-American named Beverly Overton was also arrested. Interesting. Doc Woods, the accused, was arrested at Mr. Baird's farm where he worked as a cotton picker. Mr. Baird stated that Doc was on the farm around 10 p.m. Sunday night and again at 4 a.m. the same day. However, it's only eight miles from the farm to the scene of the crime. And Doc Woods was in possession of bloody garments, which he claimed were bloody as a result of an old STD. Oh, ew. (laughs) I don't, I'm assuming it was like a shirt that was bloody. I don't know what kind of STD would cause your chest to just start bleeding profusely. No idea. That'd be, that would be horrifying too. Nice try, Doc. Yeah. 
Doc was later brought before Lucinda, who positively identified him as the man she'd seen during the attack. Good. Orange Washington was the oldest son of George and Mary Washington and originally from Virginia. In 1885, he worked for Michael Butler as a builder. Gracie was the daughter of Eliza and Charles Vance and born in Texas in 1865. She was briefly married to a man named Albert Hall, who was a railway worker in Masontown, before she met Orange. Following this attack, the Annihilator wasn't heard from again until Christmas Eve, 1885. So that last one was in September. Okay. When they committed not one, but two separate attacks at two different locations. Okay. Just as their M.O. had changed from servants to now children and couples, these attacks were also significantly different. This time they attacked white women. Oh, snap. Now everybody cares. So they weren't going after... Well, people cared before, but now it's like, oh my god. Yeah. Susan Hancock, age 41, was attacked in her home around midnight on Christmas Eve and discovered in the early morning on Christmas Day. Upon examination of her corpse, she had sustained an injury similar to Mary. Something sharp and thin had been shoved through her right ear all the way into her brain. No. And her head had been fractured between her left ear and eye with an axe or a hatchet. Nope. Absolutely not. Susan had been struck in the head as she slept with an axe before she was dragged into the backyard. Her husband, who had been sleeping in another room, heard the commotion and went into the yard, where he saw a man standing over his wife. It was at this point that he threw a brick at the man, who ran off and was able to escape. Susan had been born Susan Clementine Skaggs in Alabama in 1840, had a twin sister named Martha Falwell, and a brother named William T. Skaggs. Her husband, Moses, aged 55, so he was about 15, 14 years her senior, okay. was born in North Carolina in 1830. The pair married in 1868, and in 1870, the Hancocks lived near Brenham, Texas, where they had their daughter, Lena. By 1880, they, along with Susan's sister Martha and her husband, moved to Waco, where they became neighbors. It was around this time that Susan gave birth to another daughter named Ida. Lena was 15 and Ida was 10 when their mother was murdered. Oh, awful. Between 1880 and 1884, the family relocated to San Antonio before moving to Austin in early 1885. Moses was a carpenter by trade and had hoped to get hired during the construction boom that was taking place in the city. That makes sense. Yeah. The night of Susan's murder, their daughters had been at a Christmas party and were not home. Susan survived three days from her wounds before ultimately passing on December 28, 1885. That's awful. That's awful. I, I oh, God. get so upset when people survive wounds like that and still die. Yeah. Not okay. Moses, who I'll go into more detail later, moved in with his daughter, Lena, who he lived with until his death at 89 in 1919. Susan's daughter, Lena, married Moses Ramsey at the age of 16 in February 1886. Her husband passed later that year, just nine days after their daughter, Roxy, was born in December of 1886. She would remarry three more times following his death, once in 1890 to a man named Joseph Cerbery, who she had two daughters with, Mary and Maud. She passed away in 1958 in Dallas, Texas. Okay. Susan's daughter, Ida, lived with their neighbors, the Falwells, until she moved back with them to Austin in 1887. She married an Irishman named Ashley Cooper in 1894, who was a typesetter for the Austin Dispatch and later the Austin Daily Statesman. She never had children and eventually separated from her husband in 1906 and moved to Mexico City. Which is interesting. Yeah. Attempts by her husband to serve her divorce papers never panned out. Funny. It's unclear how, when, and where she died. That's so funny. She basically just like ghosted him. Yeah, she's like, bye. She's like, bye. Mexico City is way cooler without you. <laughs> Hate it here. <laughs> Smell you later. 17-year-old Eula Phillips was killed around an hour after Susan's body was discovered. Trigger warning. The description of her attack will include mentions of sexual assault. Mm. If you need to skip ahead or stop listening, please do what you need to do. Both Eula and her husband had been attacked while they slept with their child, who was unharmed. 
It's hard to think if that that's a blessing or not, though. You know. Yeah. Or if they slept through the attack, I I don't know. Yeah. Jimmy Phillips, age 24, sustained a deep wound just above his ear on the left side of his head that appeared to have been made with an axe. Eula was not in the bed, but a trail of blood led those searching for her to the outside veranda and into the yard where she was discovered at the door of the outhouse. Her body was entirely nude, and a piece of timber had been placed across her chest and arms to pin her in place during her sexual assault. Uh, awful. It's unclear if she had been dragged from the room following an attack or if she had attempted to flee when her husband was attacked. Yeah. It's believed that she had been dragged out into the yard, gagged, before she was assaulted and ultimately killed with a blow to her head by an axe. Her husband miraculously survived the attack. That is pretty crazy. Yeah. Given the fact that no one seemed to have heard anything, it's believed that this attack was committed by two people. Jimmy could not provide the identity of his attacker. Eula Phillips was born Eula Burdett, the youngest daughter of Thomas and Alice Burdett, on April 22, 1868. She grew up with a number of relatives on her mother's side, who farmed and ranched in the area, as well as her older sister Alma, who was two years her senior. Eula's parents separated in 1880, and her mother passed away in 1882 while attempting to get a divorce. She oh. likely passed from typhoid, because there was an epidemic at yeah. that time. Eula, now 14 years old, married 21-year-old James Phillips Jr. in January of 1883. It's speculated that their marriage was an arranged one, given how quickly she married following her mother's death. Yeah, that makes sense. She needed to be taken care of, and they just kind of shipped her off to somewhere. Yep. James and Eula lived in the home of his parents, and Eula gave birth to a baby boy she named Thomas in January of 1884. January of the following year, the family moved to the farm of George McCutcheon, where James was able to get steady work. George's wife died in March that year, and later Eula became pregnant by George, who was 36 years old while Eula was only 17. Uh, gross. George purchased pharmaceuticals to terminate the pregnancy. Even better. Wow. Awesome. In October of 1885, Eula, her husband, and her son moved back into James's parents' house, which was probably a good thing considering she was safer there. The guy they had been living in with. Both were miserable in their marriage, and the last three months of 1885 leading up to her death, Eula started seeing a man named John Dickinson, who was 27 years old, or about 10 years her senior. Okay. John was single, wealthy, well connected, and handsome. In November of 1885, Eula took her son Thomas and left her husband. That would have been so scandalous. Yeah. With no plans to return, she had her friend Fanny Whipple, with whom she had been staying, return to James's home to fetch her belongings. She met with John during her time at Fanny's before moving into the home of May Tobin. Both Fanny and May ran what was called assignation houses. I think I said that right. Or assignation houses which were basically private homes where people could conduct illicit encounters without the risk of being exposed, such as at a hotel or a boarding house. So a brothel. Yes and no. A brothel plus, because you could do like other things too. Well, and she, it's not necessarily a place where they're like pimping out women. It's a place where like adulterers and adulteresses could live and meet without... Just. Risk of exposure. Yeah. In the beginning of December, James went to visit Eula and was able to convince her to move back to Austin. Following yeah. his mother's murder, Thomas Lawrence Phillips, who was one at the time, was raised by his aunt, Dora Allen. He continued to live in Austin with his aunt and uncle until 1906, after which he moved to Galveston to work as a pile driver for the Missouri Iron and Bridge Company. He married a woman 10 years his senior named Lydia Donahue in 1916, and the pair had no children. Interesting. So it's good that he was young enough when she was murdered that he would have had zero recollection of what had happened. Yeah. Wasn't terribly affected by it in, in, in that way. Following this Christmas attack, the attack stopped entirely. Weird. So who was the murderer? 
Now I'm going to go into like the list of suspects. Okay. As you can imagine, there are a number of theories as to who the real culprit was. One was a Malaysian cook named Maurice who worked at the Pearl House Hotel. Maurice told a number of his acquaintances that he planned to travel to London, which he did in January of 1886, just a few weeks after the murders stopped. Okay. The Pearl House Hotel was in the same neighborhood as several of the victims. This is crazy. Some have even theorized that Maurice could be Jack the Ripper, continuing yeah. his murder spree in London in November of 1888. But that's like two years later. Yeah. I, whatever. Take it as you will. Right. Author Shirley Harrison believes that the Annihilator and Ripper are the same person but instead a Liverpool cotton merchant named James Maybrick. James had been in Austin during the time the murders took place. James also kept a journal in which he confessed to killing sex workers. James died of poisoning, possibly arsenic or strychnine, that was administered to him by his wife in May of 1889. Nice. Which could explain why the murders, even those in London, ended. Yeah. She was like, you're a piece of shit. Yep. Drinky, drinky. Yep. The website ServantGirlMurders.com provided compelling evidence that Nathan Elgin is the likely suspect. This next theory includes mentions of domestic violence. So if you need to skip ahead or stop listening, please do what you need to do. Another theory involves a young African-American man named Nathan Elgin, who was a cook and 19 years old at the time of the murders. Nathan was shot by police after he dragged a woman named Julia out of a saloon in Mason Town in February of 1886, so just a couple Ooh. months after the last murder. Yeah. He had taken her to a nearby house where the police nearby could hear the sounds of him beating and cursing at her as she screamed for help. <sighs> police officer John Bracken, saloon keeper Dick Rogers, and a neighbor named Clave Hawkins entered the home to stop the man and his assault. Yeah. Dick and Clave pulled Nathan out of the home, and while John attempted to put him in handcuffs, Nathan managed to throw both men off him before drawing a knife. That's a lot of adrenaline. Yeah. It was at this point that John shot him, hitting him in the spine and paralyzing him. Nathan died of his wounds the following day, his death taking place shortly after the last victim had been murdered, so two months previous. Mm-hmm. Nathan has become a popular suspect due to the fact that he was missing a toe. If you'll remember, the murderer was always barefoot, most likely yeah. to make their entrance and exit as silent as possible. Right. In most cases, a footprint wouldn't be super distinctive and easy to prove in court as a match, unlike fingerprints today. Right. But because one of the footprints happened to be missing a toe, it put Nathan at the top of the list of suspects. Huh. As I mentioned... The website notes that Nathan exhibits many of the traits that are typical with a disorganized anger retaliatory or DAR serial killer profile. These include the fact that they chose victims from familiar areas and used oh. weapons of opportunity, such yeah. as the use of the axe, knives, and other blunt objects. Yep. The scene of the crime tended to be disorganized or ransacked, and the murder weapon was generally found at the scene of the crime, or at least sort of yeah. nearby. Yeah, it just kind of left there. Add to that the sexual assault and murder of the women, even though it was only two, mm -hmm. which didn't happen in every instance, but in at least a few. Yeah. This sexual aggression could be seen as an outlet for their aggression or as a substitute for another woman they wanted to get revenge against. Yeah, that happens, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Nathan exhibited many of the traits common to the DAR serial killer profile. The traits tied to this profile include childhood abuse or neglect, early violent episodes, violent fantasy, resentment of authority, escalation, and stressors. Okay. Nathan was born in 1866 and was the fourth of five children. By the time the family had relocated to Austin from Arkansas, his three older siblings had married and started their own families. His older siblings also appeared to have a different mother than him, although it's unclear if Angeline was his birth mother and his father's second wife, Susan, was his stepmother, or if he was, in fact, the son of Susan. It is believed that Susan was an abusive mother, because I think she died uh. not that long after he was born, so it's unclear okay. if, like... So during the 1880 census, 
14-year-old Nathan was listed as living with his parents and working as a servant, which meant he would have been working under the direction of women who were either white or African-American, which could have been humiliating for him. Yeah. Because he was a young teenage boy. Mm -hmm. The following year, Nathan was arrested in 1881 for carrying a pistol and getting into a fight with another young man near the governor's mansion. As you do. Which is not good. <laughs> as young boys are wont to do. <laughs> In 1882, he sent a threatening letter to one of the deputy sheriffs promising to, quote, whip, destroy, and kill him, end quote, the next time they met. He's so nice and friendly. Yep. Great. Not only that, but Nathan had grown up in Austin as the city was being built, giving him intimate knowledge of the area, which the killers seemed to possess as they were able to elude capture quite easily following each attack. Yeah. He would have been familiar with alleys, shortcuts, hiding places. He would know who tended to leave their doors unlocked, as well as which yards and houses to avoid because they own dogs. Yeah. Now, if we go back, I kind of mentioned this earlier in the episode, but in July of 1884, two African-American women were stabbed in the face while they slept. Ew. Both women survived. Oh. And the cases were treated as two separate events. That's awful. In August of 1884, another African-American woman was hit in the head with a smoothing iron as she slept. Jeez. She also survived her attack. Ugh. 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 In November of 1884, another non-fatal attack on a domestic servant while they slept was reported to police, but never published in the paper. Okay. That's four separate attacks. That could be related. In 1884, that could be related that weren't fatal. Because it wasn't long after this that Molly Smith, the first victim who died of her wounds, was reported mm -hmm. in December. And the killing spree seems to have started after that. Yeah. It seems like he just escalated pretty quickly. If it was one mm -hmm. person. And it was also noted, so you, if you'll remember, there was a pretty big window between when Molly Smith was murdered and the second attack was done in May. Mm -hmm. So on March 19th, 1885, two Swedish servants named Clara Strand and Christine Martinson were seriously wounded in their sleep, but they survived. Okay. They may be connected, may not. Mm -hmm. And then Clara Dick, who survived her attack, was seriously wounded in August of 1885. She was also attacked while she was sleeping. So that's okay. three more potential victims that survived. Okay. And let's say it's not Nathan. Mm-hmm. It could have also been any number of men who entered the city via the railroad to work at the number of construction sites around Austin. Yep. Yeah, there were a lot of people in and out. And were at several of the places close, close to the railroads, too. Yeah, I, I couldn't remember if it was the first house or the second house, but one of the first two was, like, right next to the railroad. Like, it was, like, yeah. right in front of the house. And it wasn't just criminals that were suspected. The husbands of Susan and Eula were also suspected, so the... The two white women that were murdered. Yeah. The bloody footprints that had been left on the floorboards at the scenes of both murders had been removed from the homes and brought into evidence. Both James and Moses had their feet inked during their trials, and the prints were compared to those left behind by the murderer. Mm -hmm. In the case of James, who was married to Susan, he was found guilty of second-degree murder during his trial in May of 1886, a mm -hmm. sentence that was later overturned. Okay while Moses' trial ended in a hung jury, because they were just like, we don't know. Yeah. Over the course of the year, 400 men would be arrested and interviewed. That's usually what happens. <laughs> yep. Everybody gets blamed. Yep. But on a positive note, more police officers were hired as a result, which meant more patrols, especially at night, and rewards were offered for any information on the cases. Yeah. So even though it's awful that this happened... The city became better because of it. Molly Smith, Eliza Shelley, Irene Cross, Mary Ramey, Gracie Vance, and Orange Washington are all buried in the colored section of Oakwood Cemetery in mm -hmm. Austin. Susan Hancock and Eula Phillips are also interred at Oakwood Cemetery. And ultimately, we may never know who the true murderer or murderers were. Yeah. Just reminds me a lot of Velasca. Velasca, right? yeah. Velasca, yeah. Yeah, the Villisca, Iowa mm -hmm. axe murders. And that's the story. Awful. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, it was so long. 
<laughs> yeah, it sucked. Sorry. Sorry about it. <laughs> it was all bad. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Are you ready to launch your new career in coding? Treehouse has one of the best and most affordable online classrooms for you. At Treehouse, we've rethought the learning process and built a proven system to get you the skills and knowledge you need to achieve your goals. When you're done with the course, you haven't just watched a video, you learned, practiced, and absorbed a concept. Or choose to build a portfolio, create a network, and land your dream job with our bootcamp style tech degree program. Land a dev job this year. Whatever your goal, we'll get you there. Start your seven day free trial today by clicking the link in our show notes. Hey, I'm Kayla and I host a show called A Little Wicked. On this podcast, I discuss true crime events such as disappearances, murder mysteries, and of course, serial killers that are lesser known and also ones that you may probably have heard of. Along with true crime, you can find paranormal lore and conspiracy theories to make you think about the world around you. You can find A Little Wicked on Spotify, Apple, Good Pods, Stitcher, and really anywhere else you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember to keep it wicked. This week's podcast plug is the A Little Wicked podcast. Nice. Kayla and Lexi discuss true crimes, paranormal lore, and conspiracy theories every Thursday and Sunday. And we're recently okay. guests of the show for a Can You Crack the Cramp Word segment. They are both really funny and fun to listen to. So if you like true crime meets creepypasta, go give A Little Wicked a listen. Nice. And we will have a link to their show in the show notes. And this week's listener question comes from M from the Drink Drunk Dead and Pineapple Pizza podcast. And she wants to know, who are the top five celebrities on your free pass list? Oh, um, I don't really have that list. <laughs> <laughs> I've never really thought about it before because I think the feasibility of it is weird. Well, obviously, it's never going to happen. I know. That's the whole point of it. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a list? I need to think of my list. I've, I've mm -hmm. genuinely never considered it. <laughs> okay. I have my list. Okay. Tom Hiddleston, obviously, even though I'm sad that, to hear that he's engaged, but it's fine. Whatever. Okay. It was never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Tiny violin music. Mm -hmm. Henry Cavill. Okay. Margot Robbie. Okay. David Harbour, because obviously. Yep. Yeah. And Paul Rudd, because he was my first crush, and I will love him always and forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Always and forever. Oh my gosh, who would I pick? So you've got five. Well, I know this is creepy as hell, but like Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds. Oh, Ryan Reynolds, my honorable mention. <laughs> honestly, honestly, like, I just want to hang out with them. So if like that could happen, that'd be cool. <laughs> I would just bake with yeah. Blake. Yeah. Baking with Blake and like doing that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I love how much. And then just like, like staring at Ryan Reynolds the whole time. <laughs> like, I don't want to have sex with you. I just want to make cookies. <laughs> That's fine, right? <laughs> okay. Well, and it doesn't have to be sex. It could just be like hugging. <laughs> just long hugs. Ugh. Long, awkwardly long hugs. See, what if they listen to this and we're at like a con and you paid money to hug them for it? <laughs> an exorbitantly long pause. I would do that. They're like, I knew this was going to happen. I heard about it. You, know, <laughs> you knew this was coming. You listened to episode 92 of the podcast. <laughs> you knew it was coming. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. Okay. So Ryan Reynolds. This shouldn't be Blake a surprise Lively. to you. <laughs> Chris Evans, because I want to hang out with his dog. <laughs> That's horrible. There but you like, go. You can have a dog date. Yeah, with like Willie. I think they. I think Willie and whatever his dogs. God, I'm such a terrible fan. Willie and what's his face can go play while I have coffee in the dog park. And who else? Dodger. That's the name of his dog. Ah, yeah. He's so cute. He kind of reminds me of Willie. Like if Willie ha was a mixed he's breed. A, yeah, he's a boxer mix. Interesting. I thought because he looks a little like golden retrievery to me. Mm -hmm. I love that it's like, who's your five pass? And I'm talking about a dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, hang out with you because your dog. Two more. Who would I like to hang out with? I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. 
Because now I'm getting nervous, so I can't remember any names of anyone ever, including my own. <laughs> Who am I? How did I get here? In the days go by. <laughs> <laughs> oh, musical artists. You can choose them. Yeah, you can. I want SZA. I feel like she's okay. incredible to just like exist in the same space with. And Posier. I don't know his actual name. I think his actual name's like Paul or something. I don't know. But he just seems like a shy, nerdy guy that'd be fun to hang out with. And I saw him in That's concert fair. twice. He's got a very nice voice. Wow, mine's terrible. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> like, I want to bake, bake with you and bake for the other. I want to hang out in a dog park with the other one. Uh, I just want to know the life of SZA. And then uh, the last one, I forgot already. Who did I say? Hosier. Hosier. Yeah. It'd be nice to like hang out in Ireland. Yeah. Have a picnic. Can we just like have platonic dates? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to that. I just want to have like a fun dance party with Tom Hiddleston. Okay. Henry Cavill also likes dogs and he's super nerdy. I think it would be fun to like do a dog thing and then like play a tabletop game with him because I think that'd be really fun. Oh, yeah. He might be into that. Margot Robbie is just, she's so pretty, but she's also (laughs) smart. So I think it'd be fun to just kind of like have coffee and talk to her, Mm -hmm. maybe go to a bookstore or something, and then maybe just like, hug or something <laughs> david harbour i just want to i just want to see him in his uh chief hopper ensemble because yeah and paul rudd we could do whatever i think it'd just be fun to hang out <laughs> with paul rudd you know it could be really fun just going to like lego land with paul rudd oh my god could you imagine yeah just like a theme park also i want to add as like ryan reynolds i think it'd be fun to people watch <laughs> with ryan reynolds like grab coffee yeah. and just sit somewhere and like people watch and just like hear the commentary he would give. I think it would be yeah, hilarious. Just, I probably wouldn't be able to drink. I'd probably pee my pants laughing because I'd be like, yeah. I wouldn't be able to breathe. I'd be laughing the whole time. And I would love to meet Taika Watiti. Yeah. He'd be fun too. Could you imagine he, sitting on a bench with two, the, both of them? Oh my God. Yeah. You I wouldn't think, be allowed to have like whites. <laughs> I wouldn't. I'd have to go like wearing a, a pair of Depends or something. You can have a dry stone. Why do you sound so crunchy? I am I am preparing <laughs> myself because I know I'm gonna laugh until I pee, and I don't want to have to <laughs> run away. I don't want to miss a thing. I'm just gonna do as the astronauts <laughs> do and wear, <laughs> wear a diaper. Did you just seriously wear a diaper sitting on a bench with Tycho Wazicki and Ryan Reynolds? Yep, I did. I did. No shame. Yeah, they were the fashion you would ones. too. It was great. <laughs> had a fleur de lis on it it's pretty cool all right what's something good you'd like to share now that we've talked about wearing diapers and wetting ourselves hanging out with taika what yeah. <laughs> well speaking speaking of coffee we have this coffee maker from work no one was currently using and we're not gonna send it to another conference and so my coworker is sending me an espresso mm. like for free and so I get to have my espresso compana soon, and I'm very excited because that's like my favorite thing to make. And my partner always gives me a lot of crap because he's like, we have a Keurig. And I was like, that Keurig puts grounds at the bottom, like so many grounds at the bottom, like it's it's part of its job. Like it's like, it's my job <laughs> to give you something to chew on in the morning. And I, I haven't had... It's like the grounds fairy. <laughs> I haven't had coffee there since because I'm like, it's a demon and it doesn't listen to me and it doesn't work. And so I just have been suffering without caffeine and I just be like, B vitamins are fine and they're not fine. <laughs> not the same thing. I don't exist at work for like the first hour and a half of every day until the B vitamins kick in. <laughs> but you're yeah. just in like buffering mode. It kind of feels that way. Because there will be times where I'll be checking in with my, like, the writers that I work with. And they'll ask me a question, like, first thing before I even kind of, like, log on. And I'll be like, wait, I need to reprogram and remember who I am and where I am. (laughs) And what am I wearing? And who is this dog? (laughs) 
<laughs> then I can answer your question. Give me a second to mentally reboot. And then I and then you can ask me about that really complicated ophthalmic question that I'm not qualified to answer. <laughs> Put glasses on it. <laughs> the yes. You got drops? Use those. So yeah. Solved it. I'm very happy for that. What about you? What's one good thing? Cool. I wasn't going to talk about one wheeling, but I'm like, I don't want to talk about one wheeling again. That's what I talk about all the time. So we had to get rid of one of the hides in Charlie's enclosure. Charlie is my snake because he's gotten too big for it. <laughs> so, oh, no. Like, I'm worried. I'm worried that someday he's in like. See, like an over squeezed tube of toothpaste in, in like a container trying to fit in it. Yeah, like he he can't really fit his whole body in it anymore. And I'm worried. I know he won't get stuck, but like it looked really uncomfortable. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to get rid of this. I got to get him something else. So what I did is I went to Target yeah. and I bought one of those. You've probably seen them in like the gardening section. They're those like planters that look like people. Yeah. They've got like the face on them and stuff. Oh, you you gave him one of those. He's just living. It looks really cool. So I got him one and it's like on its, it's laying on its side. It looks like something out of like a post-apocalyptic landscape. Yeah. And I have another pot that I had had a plant in that I needed to repot because it's outgrown its its safety in that pot. Okay. So then I clean that out and I put that in there. And the color theme kind of matches the whole desert thing we've got going on ambience. in this enclosure. Yeah. The ambiance. It looks really cool. And I have like rocks from our trip to the Grand Canyon. Like I got like some. Okay. Nice. Some stuff that I'd picked up. So I'm going to put other rocks in there after our trip this summer so i think it looks cool he hasn't gone into it yet because i literally just did it last night so <laughs> nice i'll take pictures when he does because i think it'll be very cute and i'm very happy with it i was gonna get him a, a hanging pot to like oh, put in yeah, there because yeah. he likes to kind of like try to get close to the top mm -hmm. and i still might do that i don't know we'll see i may get something because i have some okay. hooks that i could like attach to the top yeah anyway i have to ask if you saw the article mm -hmm. of the snakes that were like going through evolution, have you heard about that? Mm -mm. They found a snake fossil that it was it was a snake with two back legs and no front legs. Oh yeah, he has vestigial legs. Yeah, but it, they were like lizard legs, like longer, actual functional. Oh, legs. like frog type legs. Yeah. And, but but they like didn't have the front ones anymore because they had already like gone through that phase and all i can think of mm -hmm. is just this hilarious like snake trying to run but like it's too top heavy so it keeps like flopping on the ground <laughs> you know like it's trying to be like the, the jesus gecko and it just keeps like flopping because it can't handle its weight like the worst version of evolution or it's constantly doing like downward facing dog. <laughs> it just yeah. can't. It just, just like eats. shoves its face into the ground. <laughs> just eats dirt constantly because its back legs are like not working. That's why it died. It was like, we can't do this anymore. <laughs> it's probably kicked him out. He's like, you guys, you're just really weighing me down. Just nod its whole it off. That's how it evolved. <laughs> They just knew to eat their own legs. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the, the true history of snakes. They had legs, they chewed them off, and now they're noodles. So. And now they're better for it. You're welcome, science. I'll be waiting for my <laughs> degree in the mail. Yeah. I did it. Congratulations. Anyway, shall we? We shall. You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at Yield Crime Pod and on Instagram and Facebook at Yield Crime Podcast. We're also on YouTube. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. You should do it. We have a P.O. box if you'd like to send us something in the mail. You can write to us at Yield Crime, P.O. Box 341, Wyoming, Minnesota, 55092. You can also email us at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Submit your questions, story ideas. Just say hi. Please do. 
If you'd like to support the show but can't do so financially, you can leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, and you can now leave ratings on Spotify. And actually, Podchaser is doing their reviews for good again this month. Nice. It's their third year doing reviews for good. Nice. They will donate 25 cents to World Central Kitchen's Chefs for Ukraine for every podcast and episode review left on Podchaser in April of 2022. Dang. And they double the donation amount anytime a podcaster replies to that review. If you have any platform you're going to go on this month, please do Podchaser if you can to do some real good in the world. I plan on also taking part by reviewing a lot of my fellow podcasters that I have not reviewed yet and also replying to any reviews that are left for us. But anyway, this review comes from Vladimir via Apple Podcasts in Canada. Nice. And I know this person. It's our friend Brad from Doomsday. Hey. And he says, hot take, yield crime podcast over my favorite murder. What? No. <laughs> Yeah. That just made me nervous. <laughs> I'm sweating now. Lindsay and Madison are great partners in Yield Crime. I thoroughly enjoyed the first time I heard them and began a binge from the beginning of their library. The episodes are well researched and comedic, and the topics are well curated. They quickly replaced my favorite murder in my rotation. Oh my gosh. I don't. Th- thank you. Thank you. But also now I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> i love you brad you're a gem that's so nice thank you if you want to support us financially you can do so over at buy me a coffee for a one-time donation you can join our patreon and donate on a monthly level even as low as a dollar a month will get you early ad-free access to all of our content mm-hmm. you can also head on over to redbubble to purchase some of our merch or you can head over to our tea public shop as well and on that note as always i'm Lindsay, and i'm madison And we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime.